we're going to move on because in our next segment, we're going to deal with a neuropathic pain syndrome and we're going to discuss current diagnostic criteria for complex regional pain syndrome. We want to know the clinical characteristics of various CRPS subtypes. We're going to discuss management strategies and patient selection. And with that in mind, Chris, uh, what are the symptoms and clinical characteristics of CRPS uh, that present on clinical exam? Diagnosing CRPS can be quite a conundrum. It's a combination of sensory, motor, uh, somatic, and superficial changes and motor changes. Now, there is classification provided by the International Association for the Study of Pain that is largely designed to diagnose acute CRPS. Um, we have many patients that are, I think, being overdiagnosed with CRPS that really don't have CRPS. Well, that, that brings up the question, right? What other conditions present with symptoms that look like CRPS but aren't? I would say you got to rule out other potential contributors to a CRPS-like presentation. That could be an infection, that could be a rheumatological condition, that could be a vascular disease. Um, it could be a whole variety of medical pre presentations, diabetic myelinitis, some type of nerve compression, cancer. All of that can potentially present as CRPS. We don't have a lot of data. Correct me if I'm wrong, but my sense of this is we don't have a lot of data uh, about the pharmacologic treatment of CRPS. So what factors should clinicians consider when selecting a medication regimen, Joe? Well, I think with CRPS, whether it's type one or type two, which is more ner nerve related, uh, I think of aggressive, adequate, and appropriate analgesic regimens are needed, as well as physical and occupational therapy right up front. So this is early, not something, right, early. you don't want to be waiting on this. If this is something that you really feel strongly about that diagnosis, then you should go after it, even if you, later on do some more investigative work to try to uh, figure out what's, you know, if it is definitely, as Chris said, a CRPS. Th there aren't a lot of diagnostics that we can use, too. That's sort of the problem as well. Um, but I, I think when we're looking at these patients, we should have something that is going to um, address their treatment in a multimodal strategy, a combination of uh, antihyperalgesic or adjuvant therapies with uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, particularly for CRPS1, maybe bisphosphonates uh, have also shown to have some type of uh, efficacy related to them as well. What about opioids? Are they there? You know, I, I think with opioids, again, they're not a first-line type therapy in these patients, um, and certainly there's always concerns about using opioids um, long-term with patients. Uh, I do think there is a role for them maybe as a second or third-line type therapy, um, and particularly in combination with other agents. Now, Jeff, what about some of the other agents? Uh, dive in here if you want. Sure. We've got TCAs, sodium channel blockers, gabapentin, lots of other stuff. Where does that all fit in? You know, Peter, I, I'll tell you, I, I learned early on with the treatment and the, uh, the diagnosis and treatment of, of complex regional pain syndrome, this is a, the, the treatment modality for this is what I call the kitchen sink. Because this is probably, in my opinion, one of the worst neuropathic pain conditions that patients can have. Mm -hmm. And we talk about needing every type of treatment modality, including coping mechanisms. These patients become miserable very quickly. They have a deformity of one of their limbs. They have extreme pain. They don't sleep. They lose their jobs. They, are, they become socially dysfunctional because of, uh, because of, of those issues. Uh, so I think about the kitchen sink philosophy, and I, I really try to maximize that multimodal analgesic approach. I agree with Joe. I try to limit opioids at, at first, but it's such a bad condition that eventually most of my patients, I'd say, and do end up on opioids. And what about interventional methods? Direct, if you will, surgical or direct intervention. Um, what about that, Chris? What approaches seem to have been successful, if any? I think there could be some very good role for interventions. I would start off with sympathetic blocks, uh, stellate ganglion block or a lumbar sympathetic block. If that, it helps you sort out where the pain may be coming from, and I do believe that if that's not effective, you can move on to a plexus block, whether if it's brachial plexus or lumbar plexus. And if that's not effective as well, you can go ahead and do an epidural injection with local anesthetics. So the whole point is to reset the nervous system, and that's what a nerve block accomplishes. And what I would also add from a treatment perspective to what Jeff mentioned uh, and, and Joe mentioned is, in the early phase, you can consider a, an oral prednisone trial, uh, and in some of these patients, a ketamine infusion or a lidocaine infusion can also be reasonable as well. You know, when I hear you talking about uh, steroids, ketamine infusions, um, we're talking big guns here. This, this syndrome is not to be taken lightly, is it? This is bad stuff. At, you know, as I mentioned, this is, this is one of the worst neuropathic pain conditions. And it turns out when you look for the etiology of this condition, even though it presents as a peripheral phenomenon, like our PHN, 
this is really a centrally mediated phenomenon where there's, talk about the classic example of central sensitization, where the brain and spinal cord perceive something is wrong in the extremity. So they send all these mediators out to swell and sweat and turn colors and temperatures. I mean, th this is a devastating condition. And you know, when you look at the, the future of various types of potential treatment modalities, you have uh, alpha lipoic acids, you have uh, protein kind of C inhibitors, but nothing really has been a home run either. So I think we have to uh, really get used to what we have uh, at the current time uh, and incorporate those strategies early on. So aggressive multidisciplinary, multimodal treatment is necessary. And uh, I agree, we don't want to overdiagnose patients with this, but at the same time in the process of figuring it all out, maybe that's what you need to do. And when I heard you uh, talking about giving local anesthetics as, as epidurals, these are time limited. I mean, you put them in, they go away, they get resorbed, they get metabolized. Um, so my sense of what you're trying to tell me is that you're interrupting the the feedback pathway for a brief period of time, and then you hope that something resets. Right, or there could be some structural receptor related changes where the nerve block is working for a longer duration of time because the sodium channels are different in the chronic pain patient. And I just wanna support Joe's comment of early intervention. I think that is pivotal and critical in the CRPS patient. And I'm sorry, go ahead, Jeff. You know, Peter, I was going to say, uh, it, just by coincidence, I had a call yesterday from the office. Uh, an orthopedist called in with an 11-year-old girl who he thinks has CRPS after a, a, a fracture of her foot. Oh, boy. Uh, so I was sitting, I was at a, at a panel meeting, and I was sitting next to one of our you know, lead academic uh, interventional clinicians, and his first recommendation for treatment was a spinal cord stimulator. He said, in his opinion, all oh, the medication management is very difficult, it's hard for patients to tolerate, it's not all that efficacious, and he's had very good success with these high-tech interventional devices. I would say that's true. I think peripheral or central or, or spinal cord stimulation is not a bad idea, and I think, again, in these patients, you truly adopt a biopsychosocial model with them. Uh, it's unfortunate because uh, we do see it in younger patients, and uh, we do see it more in men than women. Um, and we're not really even sure about the point prevalence uh, as well. So it's something that I think primary care doctors probably could benefit learning more about. Uh, and I'm very hopeful for some of the uh, potential new modalities that are coming our way. Uh, hopefully they will show uh, rel reasonable safety and efficacy uh, because we need, we need treatment options, particularly for this, uh, this manifestation. It's interesting how many non-